And we are very fortunate to have Rob Handel with us. He flew in last night from Pittsburgh um, to be with us today. He's a founding member of the Playwrights Collective 13P, which has won two Obie Awards, and he heads the Dramatic Writing Program at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. His most recent play, Amaze, was produced by New York Stage and Film in 2011, and he was commissioned by Opera Theater of Pittsburgh to write the libretto for Nightcaps, a cycle of mini operas to premiere in summer 212, which I think actually sounds incredibly fascinating. Um, <laughs> And uh, we will be starting momentarily. Yeah, I think there's a little room. But we can clap right now for him to welcome him. And I'm coming right back, but I'm going to give keys to somebody, so I'm going to be distracting you. <laughs> Poughkeepsie, New York, so if I start talking really fast, you can just yell out, slow down. That's okay. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I'm from Poughkeepsie, and I became a playwright in the United States, which is a very silly thing to do, of course. Um, it, being a playwright is one of the, is one of the worst you know, possible career choices you can make, along with poet or composer. Um, but uh, I've had a great deal of luck uh, with some of the big breaks that Marcella was talking about. And, yeah, and yes, I did just write this opera, uh, which is a new thing for me. I live in Pittsburgh now, teaching, at, heading the dramatic writing program at Carnegie Mellon University. And the, one of the local opera companies asked me to write um, an evening of short operas, like mini operas, uh, for, because they were sort of relaunching their company. And so they got eight different composers, and they wanted to do an evening where there were a whole bunch of short operas, and then they was sort of a cabaret night. So I wrote all the words, and then they connected me with eight different composers. And it was very different than what I thought it was going to be, because I thought that when you, I, you know, I'm a theater person, so I practice a collaborative art form. So I assumed that I would be collaborating with these composers, like we would be in the same room, talking about what might happen in the operas, but it wasn't like that at all. I, they just kept calling me and saying, send me the words, and then I would send them the words, and then they would say, great. <laughs> and I don't know what it is, is going to be, but now I'm waiting to go to the show and see what it sounds like. But it's very odd. One of them sent me the score, which was interesting. I, I actually do read music, so it wasn't as strange as it might have been. Um, but I'm not used to reading opera scores, so I, I, I can't say that really helps me a great deal, but it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this sort of, I guess that leads me into talking about playwriting, because I'm here to talk about storytelling across uh, cultures, but for me, um, this is very closely tied in to playwriting, and I'm going to talk about why I think plays are such a great form for doing this, actually. Um, and is anybody here a playwright? Has anyone written a play? What, so one, two? Okay, sorry. All right, well, you can, today we're going to write like three plays, so it'll be great. And, and there, there'll just be the beginning of plays, but by the time we're finished, you'll be well on your way. And playwriting, of course, is, is different than um, every other kind of writing, actually, as far as I'm concerned. Because why? Well, does, does anyone, why is playwriting different? I, it's very different in terms, I think, of who the words on the page are for. Does anyone know what I mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. It's for the other actor to get his cue. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you continue speaking. Right, so. And it's the not, audience. Yeah, and the. And for the audience. And for the audience. Yeah. Right, so it's, it's your, you, you write these, these words on the page, but it's as unlike a novel or a poem where, the, where someone reads it and then the artistic experience is complete, right? There's you and the reader. Instead, you give these, this page full of words to the director, the actor, the set designer, the costume designer, the lighting designer, the sound designer, in the ideal world where you have that many collaborators, and they create an event in time and space on a stage 
and then that reaches the audience. So it's it's and this is entirely obvious, but it's a different way of thinking that you have that is completely different than writing um, for a reader. I don't actually I don't actually write for readers. I don't write prose or I don't and I don't write poetry. And when I'm called upon to do so, I find it extraordinarily difficult, even though I've uh, been writing for 22 years, because I'm used to this other way of communicating, and it's a, di a different kind of way of thinking. And the kind of information that the actor needs, or that the director needs, or the designer needs, is a different kind of information sometimes than the kind you would write if you're writing a story or writing a poem. You want to tell, because they're your collaborators, it's a collaborative art form, you're counting on them to add things to the play that you don't, you wouldn't think of. That's why you have brilliant designers of sets and costumes, why you have brilliant actors who bring things to the play that you, have, that you wouldn't know on the page. And you want them to have space to make those things. And so you don't want to tell them exactly what to do on a microscopic level. You don't want to, you know, you don't, you may have read, you may have in your life read a play. For example, Edward Albee, who actually does this, if you've ever read a play like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, he'll have a character say, you know, Martha, angrily, but with a tinge of jealousy, and, you know, then the line, you know, what? Um, <laughs> You know, which is sort of micromanaging the actor's job, right? I mean, really, the actor should read what and figure out what they're supposed to be acting in that situation. And so I, I'm on this side of people who like to give the collaborators more freedom to do what they do well. So what I always tell my students is that your job as a playwright is to give all these collaborators the amount of information they need to put on the play, and no less, but also no more. So figuring out where that line is is very interesting and very uh, and very difficult. The we live in when I you know I'm teaching obviously in America and where a lot of people have grown up knowing two kinds of plays Shakespeare, which is unusual because um, the scripts we have from Shakespeare were not actually written down by him, so they don't have stage directions. We don't know what he wanted visually because he was directing and acting in his own plays. He could just tell people, you stand over there, and this is where you kill him. So the editors later had to make all those things up. So people have read those plays. And then they've read uh, plays from the golden age of American playwriting, as it's thought of, which is Eugene O'Neill and Gordon Wilder and Arthur Miller and those plays. And those plays actually tend to have a lot of description telling you what's on stage. Because they were writing in an era where every year on Broadway, there were 108 plays produced. And so there was a lot more money and a lot more resources. And if you said, the curtain goes up on the French Quarter of New Orleans, and there are two buildings facing each other, and we see the inside of one of them. And you could expect that that would actually happen. A playwright running today is probably going to see their plays produced in a 70-seat or a 99-seat theater, which is a little bigger than this room on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, if they're very lucky in their career, uh, right? And it, uh, because the theater has changed considerably, it's become not a highly valued resource in the U.S., and now there are eight plays produced on Broadway every year. So um, you're running for a different uh, kind of environment. So you, like, this is, again, why you want to say, the curtain goes up and we're in the living room. And then let the designers and the directors you're working with decide what you need to let the audience know where they are. It, you know, again, not too, not too little, but not too much. In the recent, Tony, Tony Kushner just recently wrote a uh, play that was um, on, uh, done at the Public Theater. He hasn't written a play in, in 10 years, and so it was a big deal. Uh, and it was sort of his homage to Arthur Miller, and um, so he had, so he wanted to have this sort of, you know, realistic set on stage. So he built a house with like a working kitchen where the characters could cook and make dinner and eat dinner. And at one point, someone in the first act, someone punched the wall and like the wall broke open and there was you could see the wires and things inside, uh, you know. And this was in, a, you know, like about a 500 seat theater. But by today's standards for drama, this was actually asking for a lot from your uh, collaborators because you have to be prepared to work on an even more minimal level than that. Anyway, that's just some sort of context about writing plays, but. I think that, um, you know, so you're still, but your, your tools are still the same, though, as, as when people were writing it, you know, earlier in the 20th century uh, and, and during all the, that golden era I was talking about, because, you know, you basically have two sets of tools as a playwright. You have dialogue, um, which you mentioned right away, and the dialogue, of course, is a given. I mean, that's the thing that we all know is going to be part of the play, and that no one is supposed to change it. And when you go to see your play, no matter what else, what other strange decisions your collaborators have made, they're supposed to say all the words. 
than our dialogue. So I think you know she's supposed to come in and say what at the very least. You know, even if she if it's a product if it's an avant-garde production in Berlin, she'll probably be holding a pig or something. But nonetheless, <laughs> she's supposed to say what, right? Um, and then you have your other tool as a playwright is whatever you're putting in the stage directions, whatever visual information you're going to call for, whether you want to, whether you say the curtain goes up. Or actually, there's probably no curtain today. You realize, right? So, uh, but the lights go up and you're in a living room. So there'll be something indicating a living room, or, or you know, whatever it is you want to call for. And, and however imaginative you want to be is going to tell your collaborators something about the world, the play that they're in. A very hot playwright of the last few years in the United States is Sarah Rule, um, who had a big success in the play called The Clean House, and has written another other very beautiful plays. And she doesn't write a lot of description, but what description there is, is very fantastical. So she'll say, you know, enter a character, he's dragging a gigantic tree. And that tells you something about the kind of magical, realist world of the play that you're in. So then, even this play is produced all over the country, and every production of it is going to look completely different. But in every case, the designers are going to try to, try to create something magical in the world that they're looking at, whether they're doing that with color, whether they're doing it at, with big effects or little effects. An actor can be dragging a tree without you having to get a tree. You know, that used to go like this. And, but it tells the actor something about the kind of world that they're in. So, and the reason we have people like Sarah and my colleagues in my company, 13P, which is a company um, that was created by 13 playwrights to promote our own plays um, about eight years ago. And the reason, the way the, the place that we're coming from aesthetically, which I think is, is typical of what's going on in theater right now, which is, it makes it a very exciting field, I think, in the US, um, is that we're kind of the second generation of playwrights who were trying to rediscover language. What happened in the American theater was that in the 1980s, when I was growing up, there, all the talk about theater was about directors. Um, directors mostly with international reputations, like Robert Wilson and Ariane Mnuchin and um, the Worcester Group, which is based in New York, but now towards the world. That was the company that Spalding Gray was a part of and Willem Dafoe was a part of back then. And they would create these uh, very visually oriented, postmodern, large spectacles and use a big visual vocabulary. And they weren't very interested in words, and they didn't have playwrights working in their companies. Uh, so they would either do existing plays, um, like Gertrude Stein plays or old uh, Arthur Miller texts, or things that weren't plays uh, as the spoken texts, or make up their own stories, as, which is how Spalding Gray began telling his autobiographical tales. Or um, they would use pieces that do pieces that didn't have words at all, and because this was the exciting thing going on in theater when uh, they, they, they were when I was young, it was not a very exciting era for playwriting. Um, the, the people who were writing plays started to write more like television shows. Some of them actually just went to work for television, and it was the theater was not a, a very dynamic. The new plays were not a very dynamic zone, and that was sort of what turned that around was a group of people that included Tony Kushner and Mac Wellman and Paula Vogel. You might have heard of Paula's uh, play, How I Learned to Drive, which won the Pulitzer Prize. And they were really interested in recapturing the excitement about language that went back to the age of Shakespeare. When they were really excited in getting back to the ideas of theater that came from Shakespeare and the Greeks while writing about contemporary life. So they wanted to bring things back to be centered on the actor and the actor's voice and language and the kind of chewiness of language and the Americanness of language. Tony Kushner is a big fan of Melville and a big fan of Moby Dick, and I think you can see that in his extremely dense um, but funny monologues and that draw on lots of different kinds of source material in order to propel the language forward. And so the generation that came after Tony Kushner and Matt Bellman and Paul was the generation that I'm part of, and we tend to be very interested in language while also being interested in more fantastical visual worlds sometimes. Or, more, or just generally more interested in visuals. Um, so I, so they, they laid, sort of laid the groundwork and got people excited about playwriting again, particularly Angels in America, which is a normally successful play all over the world. It got people very excited about uh, written play, uh, you know, text-based theater again, I think. So I think that, um, so when I think about storytelling across cultures, my impulse as a playwright is to explore this in terms of language. And I think that works really nicely because conflicts between different cultures 
or areas where different cultures are trying to communicate, whether they're, they're, these conflicts are between nations that don't understand one another, or generations that don't understand one another, or fans of different sports that don't understand one another, you know, wherever there are these communication gaps, they play out on the ground as problems of translation, I feel like. And so you can get something that you can stage. You can put those conflicts of translation on stage and see people trying to understand each other's words. And there's lots of potential there. I think about, and again, I use culture in all kinds of ways because, I, again, when I think when we think about the global society we live in, we're also talking about the internet and the way that that's separating generations and also bringing people together from across the globe that don't share a common language, like Japanese or English people, but or English-speaking people, but they share interest in the same technology and they're also learning how to communicate and creating new languages to communicate in. I live in. Um, as I said, I recently moved to Pittsburgh, where the local language, you know, has a lot to do with football and hockey. And um, I grew up in New York, so my idea of a sport is baseball or tennis, which are, of course, are, are correct sports. And um, so we don't really speak the same language because I see that th they see these things as sports that look to me more like a fight, and I, I expect a sport to look at two teams playing. So, but that's a cultural gap which I'm trying to cross myself. Um, there's probably a great play about that to be written. We don't have enough sports plays. Anyway, um, so uh, one of the one of the pl uh, first examples of this that I thought of was um, I'll just read a little tiny bit of this was another Tony Kushner play from about ten years ago called Home Buddy Cobble. Does anybody know this play? Home Buddy Cobble. This is the first play that, uh, or the second play he wrote after Angels in America, and it was about Afghanistan during the period where it was overrun by the Taliban in the 1990s. And it, uh, by a strange twist of fate, it was uh, scheduled to be produced in New York almost immediately after September 11, 2001. Like about a month later, this opened at New York Theater Workshop. So it was a very um, strangely disturbing and prescient event to go see it uh, this, as we, at the moment that we were all learning about uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan for the first time. And um, it's a very sad play. Not surprisingly, and there's a scene where um, the characters who are sort of confused, lost, uh, a British family who come to Afghanistan looking for a lost family member uh, are led as a clue to a woman named Mahala. And Mahala is a librarian in Afghanistan and from Kabul. And the, as a result of the Taliban taking over the country, she's lost her mind. And um, so she, when she first appears in this scene, she delivers this speech that goes on for pages and pages, talking to the, trying to help the young English woman. And she s switches, without really knowing that she's doing it, between Dari, which is her native language, French, which she's also fluent in, and English, which she's also fluent in. And meanwhile, the translator, who shares uh, Dari and some French with her, is, is trying to translate everything she's saying into English for the benefit of the young English girl who's listening. So it's a very complicated scene where she's speaking at, uh, in these three languages at, great, at a great pace, and the translator is trying to translate um, the Dari and other things that she's saying into English for the other character. And this is all going on simultaneously. Uh, and it's an extremely, it's a extremely anguished speech. Part of it, in part of it, Mahala yells, they have closed library, library. This is Islam. Muslims are les gens du livre, scholars, poets, les peintres, les compositeurs, my professor. Les philosophes, les mathématiciens, nous savions comment marcher l'univers de siècles avant vous. Nous avons inventé les nouveaux et les zéros et les médecins. Ils ont il, 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 oh, fermé la bibliothèque. And so meanwhile, the translator is trying to translate this and to the English girl and saying, the Muslims have been through history educated people. We are once in advance of the West in knowledge. His English isn't perfect either. So the Taliban have closed down the so, library and so, you know, and all this. So this, in the, again, this is an example of, uh, I'll show you a little bit of what this looks like. I can get this thing up. Uh-oh. Wait. I'll go find it. You have to leave the house. Uh, um, but again, it was working, but now it's not sleeping. 
I didn't touch it, it just fell asleep. I know I was talking for a long time. That seems rude. Ah. I should have engaged in more. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. What did you do? Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, you can't really see that at all. But um, so again, like just to show you exactly again how much work you have to do as a playwright to uh, work with people on the page. And I always tell my players, you have to assume, by the way, that you know that you're not going to be there in the rehearsal room to help them. You know, just to, because you're uh, because of course your play is going to be so successful that they'll be doing it long after you're dead. So you have to have all the information here in the book. Right? So this is the bit I was attempting to read very badly, and. Um, which doesn't have any Daria in it, but she goes into Daria on the next speech here. But so they, so t a Kushner has given the actor the lines that they're saying, and then a translation, which is just for the purpose of the actor, so the actor knows what she's saying, in case she, the actor doesn't speak French. Then this is the line for the translator, which is, which is not this, exactly the same as this, because he's translating, and first of all, she's, he doesn't understand everything, and he's behind her, so he's trying to catch up, right? And so on. And so, so he's translating all the, the author is translating all the French and all the Dari. The translator is trying to, uh, Quaha speaks a bunch of languages too, so he's trying to translate the French and the Dari. And there's a point in the scene shortly after this where he doesn't translate what she says because he's offended by it. And so, now you have to remember the audience in this scene is in the same position as Priscilla, the young English girl. Because we, we assume the audience, that most of the people in the audience don't speak French and certainly don't speak dark, right? So she's sort of our representative on stage. The play is from her point of view, because she's come to Kabul looking for her mother, and she's lost, and she's confused, and she doesn't understand what's going on, and she doesn't speak the language. So the audience is in the same position as Priscilla here. And what this does is it brings the audience closer to her emotionally, because <coughs> they're having the same experience of being lost in Kabul as she is. And this is one, this is actually, I think, central to how translation in different languages can be very exciting and work really well in theater, depending on where you want to put the audience. You can choose to bring the audience closer to a character. You can choose to put the audience in a democratic position where they have a, that relationship with more than one character. Like, for example, if, there were, if we decided in our production of Comedy Cobble that we would project subtitles on the stage, which is not done very much in theater, but it can be done, um, so that we, the audience, knew everything that Mahala was trying to say even though Priscilla only knows what is being translated to her, then we would be in a, we would be in a sort of like, in the position of God, right? We would, we would know everything that was going on. We would be in the universal uh, narrative position. And that would be interesting too, but it would push us away from Priscilla emotionally and because we would know things that she doesn't. So we would put her ahead of her in the story. Um, this is a, and I think this is a really interesting tool to use in theater to figure out where, where the audience's point of view is. Like in Richard III, the first thing that happens in Richard III, right, is Richard III comes on stage and he says, this is the winter of our discontent, and he starts talking to us. And he does this throughout the first half of the play, pretty much. And every time someone goes off stage, he tells us, you know, what, how he's going to fool them, or how he's going to kill them, how he's going to become king, what he's going to do. And so we're taken into his confidence, and that puts us sort of on his side, and gives us, puts us the play, makes the play from his point of view. Because we know everything that he's going to do, and no one else on stage does. So everyone comes on stage and we watch them get tricked and then killed um, because we're, we're with him all the time, which is an interesting and very pleasurable experience because he's sort of a fun bad guy for most of the play. Then in the last two acts, um, because it's Shakespeare, the universe has to be put to rights and Richard III has to be punished and die. And that would sort of mess up the whole structure, except and Shakespeare sort of cheats by just having Richard stop talking to us when that happens because he sort of, so he sort of loses the courage of his own convention. But, you know, if he was my student, I would give him, like, a B for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's a, but it's a great technique to use, and it shows how the point of view works, I think. Um, and there's another, there's an, another uh, great device you can use in terms of point of view, which I'm going to come back to later, which is 
this, which is you have someone who's lost. You have someone who's the newcomer to this world. So you can create a world that's very strange and unfamiliar that the audience doesn't know anything about. Like if you're a New Yorker in 2001, you're learning for the first time about what's been going on in Afghanistan for 10 years, probably. And you're in the same position as Priscilla, who's had to go to Afghanistan because her mother is lost there. And she doesn't know anything about it. And so she has to learn it all for the first time, as does the audience. So the play is from her point of view. And that's a very smart way to get a lot of information across the audience in a, uh, while having an emotionally sensible reading to do it. Does that make sense? Um, so, and this, this is interesting. I think that this is also a manif manifestation uh, in these plays of how you can I think one of the great things about, about plays that excites me so much is that you can have characters who embody the conflict that you're interested in writing about. And when, and, and, and when I say embody, I mean, I mean that very literally, because you're asking an actor to come on stage and physically have the conflict that you're interested in, in themselves. They're going to stand there and they're going to represent this conflict and this, this conflict is going to play out and what happens to them in the course of the play, whether they die, whether they fall in love, whether they end up happy, whether they end up sad, is going to tell us something about your relationship with the theme that you wanted to attack. So this is where you start writing a play right now. So first you think, someday I want to write about this subject. Maybe you want to write about Kabul. Maybe you want to write about television. Maybe you want to write about baseball, as I do. Um, I had a friend who uh, always used to say, someday I'm going to write a big novel about money. I don't know if he did that, but I thought it was a great idea. Um, and I don't know what his positions were about money, but, or what he thought the conflicts were about money. But I thought that was very interesting. But even before we think about what the questions are, what is, what is, the, what is a big theme for you that someday you, you would like to write about? Or maybe something that you write about all, already all the time. Anyone want to throw some out? Who is a theme? Criminal. Crime. Crime, good. <laughs> what else? Obsession. Obsession? Homelessness. Homelessness. So, crime, obsession, and homelessness. These are, these are good, all very funny. Um, <laughs> what, what are some of the. Uh, um, so what are some what what would the conflict be in each of these stories? Um, crime, crime, of course, you know, uh, a lot of. Uh, let's see, what 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 do we have? In, who, is some, who said crime? What do you what? So what kind of conflicts are in play when when we're writing about crime? Do you think? Punishment. Punishment, right? I would guess so. Right? Yeah. We had, one of the um, one of the big the most famous alumni in America of our school of drama where I teach at Carnegie Mellon is Stephen Bochco, who created uh, Hill Street Blues and a bunch of other very famous police shows in the US. And he came to talk to us and he said one of the most, that the, a key moment for him in learning about cops, because he's very interested, he got to law school and he was very interested in the legal system as it played out on the street. And he said the most interesting uh, thing he learned, which he uses all the time in his writing, is that when they catch a suspect and they bring him in, they leave him alone in the room. This is for like a murder or something serious. And he said, if, if they're terrified as they look at them through the glass window, then they're innocent because you know, they, they don't know what they're doing there and they think they're going to go to jail for something they didn't do. And if they're guilty, they're relaxed. And sometimes they even fall asleep because part of them is so relieved to be caught that they don't have to spend any more time wondering, am I going to get caught? But that was interesting. Anyway. Um, Yes, you're right, crime versus punishment, right? Yeah, crime doesn't pay. Um, what about obsession? What are some of, you know, the, the price of obsession can also be very high. Right, how would that, what would, how would that, how does obsession divide a person? You, you could be obsessed about a social issue. Right. Like in the constant garden, for Right. And, and uh, when you're obsessed about social issues, does that mean you're going to pay a price in your personal life? Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to be happy and to fix the world at the same time? That's an age-old question, I think. What about homelessness? Are there, are there, what, how would, I wonder who the, who the main character would be in a homelessness story. You can do it from a point of view, from a naturalistic point of view. Yeah. How, how 
being at the bottom of everything. Right, so you're at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are there any advantages to being at the bottom? In an entertaining narrative perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you have, nothing, you have nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose, right? If I'm not afraid anymore, I'm Right, you can't fall any further, right, I suppose, when you're a bottom. That's a good something, yeah. It's very sharp perspective. Right, right. And perhaps you're free from social norms. Right, right, that's what I was thinking, yeah. Um, I mean, just, you know, uh, obviously your problems outweigh your, your advantages, but um, it might be interesting to see you look at that one thing that you do lose when you stop uh, getting out from the bottom. Um, so in any kind of, in whatever your story is, you figure out what are these conflicts that your character has inside them as a result of this, of this theme, and then figure out um, how these, and it can also be a conflict between two characters, the homeless person and the person who wants to help him or her. Also, it could be an interesting, might be an interesting starting point. And then, once you figure out whether this conflict is internal or between two people, or between a person and you know the world, as in Ibsen, where there's usually one person versus the city, you know, um, you figure out the question then becomes, how, okay, how do we put them in a situation that's impossible, that there's no way to, res that there's no obvious way to resolve the situation, um, and then. You ask yourself, you know, can, who, how can the character most embody this impossible position, this being impossibly torn between these two things? And and like these are some of the uh, the ways in which I think this plays out uh, in the some of the big plays of the recent times. Like, you know, if you want to write a play about the tragedy of Afghanistan, for example, um, if I say I'm going to write a play about the tragedy of Afghanistan, and you think, well, that's not going to fit. On Stage, you know, it's uh, Afghanistan is a very big subject, and I, you know, I don't see how that's going to work out. But I can write a story about a librarian who loves books and who believes that her people are the people of the book, and um, that they're literary people. She lists in this, in this speech in French, you know, um, they're painters, they're composers, they're philosophers, they're mathematicians. They have their history in these fields goes back thousands of years. And here are some people come into her city. Who are not, she does not believe are, are genuine Muslims and who does not believe that have her the same interests that she has. And what do they do? They burn the books and they shut down the library and they to her to destroy her way of life in her perspective, right? And so as a librarian, her response to this is to feel that she's lost everything that she loved. And she has this great speech. Um, let me on the next page. Um, oh right, where she, where she uh, here where she yells at, at the Taliban. I pray to God to let all the birds of the air be curses to fall on couple with dead eyes and broken necks. Je suis bibliothèque, and she says in French, I am a librarian. I want to walk down the streets again. I want to go to parties again. I have nothing to read. Um, and that's what this is. Mahal is the kind of character that I'm talking about when I say that you can put someone on a stage who embodies that. She's embodying the tragedy of Afghanistan, like in this play, by being a librarian in a place where books have suddenly been starting to be destroyed. Another famous example from Tony Kushner's work would be the protagonist of, or uh, one of the multiple protagonists, but one of the main characters in Angels in America, if anyone's seen Angels in America or read it, is Roy Cohn, the legendary, who was a real, who was a real person, who um, was, of course, a, you know, a very powerful uh, kingmaker and Republican confidant who was also a closeted gay man. And when, in 1983, when the AIDS epidemic started to sweep uh, New York and San Francisco, he was in, a sort of, uh, he was immediately placed in a kind of impossible position where something he'd been hiding all his life that was antithetical to the people who uh, put him in power and to whom he owed power and were threatened to destroy him and ultimately were, were sort of doomed to destroy him. And there's a famous scene at the end of the first act of uh, Angels in America where he threatens his doctor that if his doctor uses the word AIDS, he will destroy him. You know, he insists that his doctor not tell him what's wrong with him because he knows that it's AIDS. And that's impossible because he says, Roy Cohn is one of the most powerful people in New York. There is no way that Roy Cohn is a gay man. Gay men have no influence. So, uh, and it's another example, I think, of embodying that, that impossible conflict that's at the center of the play. And, we, and, we wait, and what happens then in, in Angels, which of course, is, as you may know, is eight hours long, is we wait to see how these forces are going to rectify themselves. How is New York 
in the Reagan era in a, in a position that it, a place and a time which is, is not uh, uh, at all conducive to addressing the needs of the gay population is going to deal with this terrible uh, tragedy unfolding in its mind. So your job now, now that you have your fabulous theme, is to figure out who, you know, what kind of, how, what are the two opposing forces in conflict in the world of your theme? And how can you get them, how can you squeeze them into one person? How can you invent a character whose position in this conflict is impossible? So like, what, if there's a homeless person and there's someone who wants to help them, what is it that makes that impossible? What is it that keeps them from doing that, from reaching it? Or is it because the, the homeless person is too proud to be helped by anyone? Is it because the person who wants to help them is doing it for the wrong reasons and the homeless person can sense that? What is it in the criminal that keeps them from being a successful criminal? Or what is it that's going to be their fatal flaw that's going to see that they get punished? And what is it about being a, an, a, an obsessive that makes it impossible to, to live with that obsession? A lot of potential there, I think, in that, in that possibility. Jean um, Wee says something really interesting, I think, about the title character of his play, Antigone, going back to the middle of the 20th century. Antigone, we all know the story of Antigone, and her duty is clear, right? She knows that she has to make everything right. And we know that she's going to do it, because she's a hero, and it's a great tragedy. There's never any doubt about that. But Ali has this very interesting moment at the beginning of the play where he has the narrator come out and says, and say, Antigone's problem is that she's a young woman and she would much rather live, but she's not going to. And then we watch that happen. Um, so that's a really interesting take on, on a conflict where we think that we know what the play's about, but here's his play, it's about something different. So now, presumably, if you follow this assignment, and you're thinking about this, you're coming up with a character who's going to be at the center of your play. So you're well on your way. Um, I'll move on to, oh, I wanted to read another, I wanted to show another example of how, um, this another quick moment from a scene of translation. This is from a British play by uh, Steve Waters called Fast Labor, which I'm, I'm very fond of. I don't think it's been, I don't think Steve Waters' plays have been done in the United States yet at all, but they're very, very interesting. Um, and he's really addressing globalization and its discontents in many ways in his plays. And, about, and so he has to deal with the problems of language and translation a, a great deal in his work. And this play, Fast Labor, is about, a, uh, is about economic migration. So it's about, the, it centers on three workers who come from different parts of the former Soviet republics who go to the north of England and they end up getting jobs in fisheries, doing uh, very, you know, uh, grim work. Um, and, in, on a factory floor where it's negative two degrees, and uh, getting fish and things like that, and then they don't get paid, and they get they have to their the person who's taking care of them, their contact in the UK, takes them to another factory and so forth. So there's uh, it's interesting uh, play where there's a lot of where the morals are more complicated than you might think, and the reason and the way that uh, Victor, the main character in this play, who's that's his picture there, embodies this. The conflict in this play is, it turns out, so we're naturally on Victor's side, right, because he's being abused by all these British people who are taking advantage of the fact that he's there and will do anything for money. And, you know, he doesn't get paid and he gets run around, he gets put up in places that no one should live and so forth. Um, but it turns out that he also will do anything in order to get ahead. He has a family back in the Ukraine that he wants to take care of. And it turns out that his morals are also extremely flexible. And that, so that as the play goes on, our feelings about him become very, very complicated. Because again, he embodies this sort of, it, it turns out he kind of embodies this world. It's very similar to the debate that's going on now, also tied up with a piece of theater in the US, about where our Apple products come from, um, how they're made in, in China, in factories where people also are working under terrible conditions and being housed in terrible conditions and have no privacy and have no rights. But at the same time, these are people who have come from the country to the big cities in China specifically in order to get these jobs because the money they're making there is so much better than the money they can make growing rice. And so it's very complicated and, and, and creates that conflict. And so a play about that would be doing much the same thing as this play. And in the first scene that we see, um, I won't read this, but uh, especially because the writing is so small, but um, what happens in, the, in this play is uh, they have to get one of the other workers. So Victor shows up at this factory. He only speaks about five words of English at this point. And they have to get one of the other workers in the factory to come and uh, translate for him. 
And so they drag this guy, Andreas, off the factory floor, and they say, you know, do you speak Russian? Translate. And he, and he, he just says, Lithuanian people were forced to speak Russian until 1989. And he just says, whatever. We can just translate. Um, which is typical, again, of, of what's going on in this play, where all the people are bringing their complicated cultural and personal histories to this world. But the world is only concerned about, really, you know, can, we, can you explain to him how to gut the fish? Um, anyway, so there's this, very, there's this very funny scene. So this is the first scene of the play. And so they bring Andreas on, and Anita, who's the British, or actually Scottish manager, asks him various questions. Like, how did you get hurt? Where did you come from? Do you understand how to get a fish? Do you know that you have to wash your hands? Do you understand what I'm telling you? Do you know who to work for? Do you understand what I'm telling you? Ask him all the questions. And the Lithuanian character is translating the questions into Russian for the worker. Except that he's not, he's not translating everything that she says. Sometimes he's sort of translating the meaning of what she says. Like, she says, you know, you report to me, and you only, you know, don't talk to anybody else. And, and he translates this as, don't trust anybody. <laughs> and things like that. And now, however, at this point in the play, we're seeing the, we're seeing the play from the point of view of the British people who speak English. And so, the two, so, the, so when he translates that into Russian as don't trust anybody, unless you speak Russian, you don't actually know that. But the two characters are speaking to each other in Russian on stage. And there's no translation available to the audience. There's no subtitles. But you can, we start to get a sense of what's going on near the end, because as it goes along, Victor finds what he's saying, the translator is saying more and more funny, and finally laughs. And he goes, what? What are you saying to him? And he pretends that it's just because his hair nut doesn't, hair nut doesn't fit that they gave him, and he looks ridiculous, and so forth. But we suspect that something's going on. And then what happens, so then what happened in the next, uh, on, in scene three of this play, a little bit later, Victor is alone with the two other workers, one from Lithuania and one from uh, Estonia or some other breakaway or probably, I forget where. And the three of them are riding in a truck by themselves, and there are no British people on stage. And so when they speak to each other, they speak in, in English. And the reason they do that is because we are now in seeing the play from their point of view. So they speak to each English, they speak to each other in English, they actually use a lot of slang because they're workers and they would do slang. So their their world has been translated into British, basically, for the British audience. But it but then in the next scene they're back talking to their handlers who are British, and so again they're speaking in very bad English to them or speaking in Russian to each other. So we create this is a vice that when there's only Russian speakers on stage, they speak English so we can understand them. But when there are British people on stage, they speak Russian because we're as confused as the British people who they're trying to pull one over on and who are trying to pull one over on them. Does that make sense? So the language point of view keeps shifting. And I think this is a really, really interesting tool and there's lots of different ways to go with it. Um, so I'm going to come back to that later, but I think this is one of the great things you can do. There's a, a play that was on Broadway this year that was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize called Chinglish by David Henry Huang, um, which is apparently about Americans visiting China and about the problems of translation. I didn't see it, but apparently they used these devices and including subtitles to show how things, everyone was misunderstanding each other in a really interesting way. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to get it quicker. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, wait. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, I just find it intriguing the whole, the order that you started thinking about themes. Hmm. So I know that with fiction writing, um, if you start with themes, it, it tends to get didactic. Sure. And so fiction writers tend to stay away from that. And what you're saying here is when you start with a theme, it really brings out the best of the play right to the beginning. I think yeah, that's a really good question. I think that, I mean, it all depends on what kind of writer you are, I think. I mean, it's a really personal choice. Do I start with a character? Do I start with a scene? Do I start with a theme? You can also start with a structural technique, although that's very dangerous. But um, <laughs> but you can do it. Um, I, I, that's, that's starting with a, and when I say a structural technique, I mean like a sort of a gimmick. Um, like in Harold Pinter's Betrayal, which runs backwards, if anyone's seen the movie or the play Betrayal. Um, and the reason that I'm drawn to that sort of thing is because my teacher was Paula Vogel, and her uh, big influence was Thornton Wilder, who often began with some sort of structural idea. Um, which is sometimes interesting to see what that would be. But I, I, the, to come back to the theme question, 
Yeah, I think that's inter I think that's an interesting point. I think that's because there's so many American playwrights are, are politically minded and intellectually driven. Um, you know, that, that tends to be a, a, a common starting point, starting from having a big idea. And I think, it, but I think again, it's an advantage of theater that the first thing you have to do is reduce it to the size of the stage. So you, so I think having a character who come that conflict produces, like Mahala in Homebody Kabul, then becomes the starting point for well, what's going to happen to her? You know what I mean? So then it sort of, it, it, it's a, I think the thing becomes less hazardous than starting with the theme, you know, Russia during the in the Napoleonic era, and then writing War and Peace, you know? I'm just thinking <laughs> suddenly about um, the, the play about Matthew Shepard, mm -hmm. The Killing. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting through that play and thinking that I was kind of being harangued. That totally. um, it, was so, <laughs> it was so trying to get me to believe, you know, what the playwright right. thought and felt, yeah. that I felt I wasn't watching a story. Yeah. And, um, there was nothing, there was no emotional investment for me as a, as a theater. Right, right. I totally know what you mean. I mean, uh, it, it, that, the Larry Project, the play by Matthew Shepard, it's not even really a kind of a play in a way. It's sort of, there's sort of, that's sort of part of the movement of kind of journalism theater that's going on. Um, because it's in, the Laramie Project is made up entirely of interviews that the, the actors and director right. went to Laramie and interviewed people and then collaged that into a play, which is, what they did was exactly like shooting a documentary, except instead of it being a documentary, they turned it into a play, which I feel like, I, I, find, I find the kind of theater almost entirely baffling, actually. <laughs> but um, it's very foreign to what I would do. But I think the reason they do it, they did it, and the reason it's successful is because, really, sort of on a marketing level, there's an intersection between people who would go see an evening about homophobia and people who go to the theater, you know, as opposed to making a documentary film about it, um, where you're going to have a more limited audience, probably. But that's an interesting question. I do think there is some terrible didactic theater going on. <laughs> um, but the kind of, but I think that the kind of play that Kushner is writing, the kind of play that J.T. Rogers is writing the kind of place that Steve Waters is writing are much more ambiguous than that in terms of where they end up morally. I think the plays that tell you what to think are not at all interesting in that. And, um, they don't find a way to my personal canon. So I think there are other, I think there is other hope. Um, if, if time allows, I might give an example from something that I wrote, which is a little bit didactic, but hopefully not too much. <laughs> um, oh, your hair is out, good. Okay, Marcella's gonna help me read a scene. So, um, uh, I'll set it up first, though. So another, I mentioned another kind of globalization, which is the internet, and um, where I feel like it was a, is a another kind of storytelling across cultures in all kinds of ways. First of all, there's the culture of those of us who use the internet. Uh, it, I mean, there's been many cultures of the internet of people who have it completely integrated into their lives. Most of them are probably under 25 now. People who have it fairly moderately, in, uh, you know, integrated into their lives, like only checking it every five minutes, you know, which would be like us. And then, you know, people who, uh, who are uh, coming to it and relearning, you know, how to live in the universe, which are, tend to be older people. Um, but everyone is involved with it now, which is very interesting, for pretty much. And um, the internet, you know, has become so much a part of human life in, in uh, so many, all over the world. And in terms of how we communicate and how we understand the world and how we get our information in the amount of time that we spend in the day that could be called working, or the amount of time we spend in the day that could be called playing. And it, it's everywhere, and it's so difficult to put on stage, or for that matter, to put into a movie. Why? Because it's so boring, visually. Um, no one wants to go to a movie or a play and see someone sitting at a computer. It's like the worst thing you could possibly do. Or playing with their phone. <coughs> You know, even though, of course, as we as we do anything, including walk down the street, now there are people playing, you know, on their phones doing something that is that is that is going beyond walking down the street, and we don't know what it is. So figuring out a way to um, theatricalize this is something that is, is yet to be solved. I think it's fair to say. I think a lot of different things going on, and um, it's it, none of them are, are really working very well. But some one of these days, someone will figure out, and it'll be great. Um, but I wanted to talk about a play called uh, Neighborhood 3, Requisition of Doom. This is a play about massive multiplayer online role-playing games. Um, what was the name of that game that everyone was playing a few years ago? Oh, uh, like uh, um, Worlds of Warcraft. Um, 
this is a, uh, a this is this is a big thing, perhaps mostly in the U.S. and Japan. Uh, but, uh, but amongst the young people nowadays, you know, the young people, anyway, in which people spend many, many hours, possibly days, online playing these games where you're a, uh, a dwarf or an elf and you're killing monsters or things like that. There are many variations of them uh, in all kinds of worlds. It's very much like when I was a kid, we played Dungeons and Dragons, it's a little bit like that. And, uh, but it's all on the computer, and there's these addictive video games where you're interacting with people over the internet, other kids in other uh, houses at their computers. And so here's this whole world, which is very, which is completely exotic to probably everybody in this room, right? And we don't know anything about it. It's very, it's completely foreign. And again, this is something that I think plays can do really well, or, or really any kind of uh, creative writing, but take you into a world that you don't know anything about, that's completely unfamiliar to you, and help you learn about it, and then tell you a story that takes place in that world. And all these kind of, a lot of these same kind of techniques that I was talking about are very good for. Uh, taking you into an unfamiliar world and teaching you what the rules are. Um, play, uh, plays are a lot in, in, in this way, like Pixar movies, actually. Uh, Pixar movies, I think, are one of the, the, the best storytelling um, lessons you can possibly have. Is to study how a movie like um, Cars or Toy Story or Monsters, Inc. works, where, um, does anyone, do people know the movie Monsters, Inc.? You guys have children, right? Some people. Okay. <laughs> in Mon Monsters Inc. takes place in this completely imaginary world where everyone is a monster, and everyone's job is to is to go through a portal into another world, which happens to be Earth, enter the closet door of a little kid sleeping, and scare them. Uh, that's the monster in your closet or under your bed. And then when they scream, you capture the scream in this container and take it back to the monster world, and that's the source of energy in the monster world for everything. Cars, electricity, computers, everything. This is a, actually a fascinating idea for, for a, a story. And the movie teaches you how this works in about one minute. And in fact, all Pixar movies teach you everything you need to know about the very strange worlds that they've created in about one minute. Because st visual storytelling is very easy, and, very, and all you have, when you want to introduce a strange world, you can do it very quickly. Um, and I think there's similar ways to do this in, in, in plays using language. But, um, Another example of a, of a play that teaches you about the rules of a very strange world are actually a lot of them can be found in Tom Stoppard's plays, a uh, British playwright who's probably in his 70s now. Um, in his play Arcadia, one of the great plays of the late 20th century, we go back and forth. We're, we're in a room in an old British house, one of those historical houses where they give tours of the house because it's been there for so long. And we go back and forth between a set of characters who are living there today doing research and a set of characters who are living there in the time of Lord Byron, talking about Lord Byron's recent visit. And we go back and forth in alternate scenes between these two characters, but the room never changes. Just people's costumes change, so we get a sense of what world we're in. And as the play goes along, inevitably, the worlds start to become more fluid until everyone is on stage at once. And it's a really exciting play for the audience, where you figure out what's going on. You figure, oh, now we're back in Byron's era. Oh, now we're back in 1995. And you are in sort of enjoying the games that the play is playing. Again, the audience in this has the perspective of God, right? Because we can see everything, and we know more than everyone on stage. And the people in the present in Nepadia are trying to figure out what happened when Byron visited this house. And but we are seeing what happened when Byron visited the house. And then we go back to the people trying to figure out. Actually, it's exactly the same convention of the novel possession by A.S. Byron. Um, in, in fact, it's a very strikingly similar story, which was written around the same time. Uh, so it's very, it's very pleasurable for the audience to have that perspective and to go back and forth between those things. And again, the audience figures out the rules of this play. Oh, we, the audience, get to travel through time, but not through space, because we're living in this we're in the same room in two different eras. Um, for advanced uh, research, there's another play by uh, Stafford called Dog's Hamlet, which teaches the audience an entirely new language. But um, that's probably too complicated to kind of just go into at the moment. Um, so. Anyway, coming back to this play, Neighborhood 3, Reposition of Doom, this is written by a young and very uh, hot playwright named Jennifer Haley. Um, who, and this, so this, it, the idea, again, this is a play about these video games, and the idea is to, for the play to make sense for both people in the audience who are familiar and who are, are not familiar with this game, um, just as uh, if you come into Homedy Cobble not knowing what happened in Afghanistan when the Taliban overran it in the 90s, you can figure that out. Um, you can learn a lot about from having from being there from the newcomers' point of view. 
So the audience is sort of the newcomer in this world, which is very strange to us. And um, uh, this is what I wanted to read. Yeah, I just wanted to read a quick scene from this. Oh, I wanted to say first, so this is the um, prime material from this play. And uh, so this is another tool that you have as a playwright, right, for your future collaborators. Notes, some things you might want to know before you attempt to put this play on your stage. Most of the play should be staged abstractly in the netherworld of a video game or modern day suburbia. Realistic elements may be added so that we feel we're somewhat recognizable and may imagine for a little while that none of what's happening previously in the play is real. That's at the last scene. However, the violence should be dramatic, unbelievable, and loud, perhaps with stupidly spurting blood like a video game. Um, anyway, it's like, uh, another tool you can use is to say something at the beginning of the play about how this play should look or how it should feel or how it should work and what you want to do with all this information that you're going to get. Um, so let's see. So, Marcel, would you, would you read the scene? So I just wanted to read the first scene of this by Al. Let's see if I can play out here. It's going to be so exciting. Now there'll be some acting. <laughs> maybe that's overbuilding it. Oh, you want me to read it with you? Yeah, maybe a little. Oh. <laughs> Actually, these characters are very, you know, they live in suburbia, so they're very neutralizing and uh, blank. <laughs> um, actually, the first thing that happens in this, so the first thing that happens in this play is a walkthrough. Now, again, as non-video game players, we probably don't know what a walkthrough is. So I'll tell you, a walkthrough is something you might find on YouTube. If you've got a new video game, right, that you heard, you heard your friends were all playing the new video game, Neighborhood 3, and you get this game home, and these games don't come with rules or instructions. You have to figure out how to play them. You, you turn on the game and you're like on a street, and you have to figure out what, you know, where do I get a weapon, where do I meet a monster, what door do I go in, where do I go, you have no idea. And you're supposed to pl play around until you figure it out, which is one of the things that makes the game last longer, and then, you know, makes you buy the next game that, that comes out. Um, so what you can do to, is you want to get hints, you want to get shortcuts. So you go on, on YouTube or someplace like that, and you'll find someone showing you how to play the game and explaining what you want to do to win. Basically, they're cheats. So in, this, so in every other scene of this play, Neighborhood 3, A Requisition of Doom, is a walkthrough where there's kind of, it's kind of dark and there's a sort of uh, loud voice telling you some of these things. Now, if you've never seen a walkthrough, which I hadn't when I went to see this play, you very quickly get the idea of what it is. So the walkthrough, the beginning of the play, the walkthrough says, the house you want is third from the left. As you face the cul-de-sac, all the houses look the same. Be careful. Move toward the house slowly. You will hear the sound of your footsteps in the street. Do not walk too fast. As you approach the house, you will see on the sidewalk a claw hammer. Pick this up. You will need it later. Like all other houses, this house will have a flesh-colored brick facade and a welcome mat in front of the door. Hint, if you kneel down and take a closer look at this mat, you will see the word welcome becomes help me. <laughs> And through the house, on your right, is a set of saloon doors. Push through these and enter the kitchen. And then the lights come up and we're in the kitchen. And, so you, and from this walkthrough, not only do you get a sense that's, that we're in something like a game, but you also get the sense that something is very wrong and disturbing here, and it's going to end badly, right? <laughs> There's a claw hammer. It's not going to be pretty. Um, I think that's a very good way to start a play. <laughs> so then we're in this scene, and then this, and, um, I just, again, there's something about the way the play looks on the page, right? There's no stage directions telling the actors how to speak or how to move or what we're looking at. There's just dialogue. So she's given, again, she's a young playwright working with a lot of contemporary collaborators, and she's expecting a lot from the director in terms of his creativity, in terms of the designers and from the actors to make their own choices about what's on stage, what the scene looks like, what it sounds like, how people are speaking, how fast it is, and things like that. Um, so we can, we can you know, exercise that, right? <laughs> so, so we're in the kitchen, and the characters are Michaela and Trevor. You want a coke? Okay. Shit, we don't have any. My brother inhaled them. That's okay. So then I just have stupid stuff like grape juice. Want some grape juice? Okay. <laughs> Only he left like a ninch in the bottom. That's okay. No, it's not. 
I'm going to rip his balls off. <laughs> I mean, I don't need grape juice. Well, nobody needs grape juice. It'd just be nice. Otherwise, we've got milk. You want some milk? No, thanks. <laughs> it's chocolate milk. Okay. <laughs> it's like we're 11 again. That's the last time I had it. When I was over here, my mom doesn't buy chocolate milk. Your mom? Why? Doesn't she sell makeup or something? Vitamin shakes. What are those? Shakes with vitamins. Can you elab or e elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> it's like powder. You add water, you make a shake. You drink it two times a day. Does it taste good? No. Why do you take it? My mom says it gives you everything you need. Does it work? Are you getting everything you need? And then there's a line for Trevor where he doesn't have any words. Um, and that's like where another player I might have written pause. But this is something more and more, uh, this is a sort of a trend that more and more uh, playwrights are doing in the US, which is like, by creating a blank space for Trevor, it's, like a, it's not just a pause, it's a pause for him, where he doesn't have anything to say, but the focus is on him. So it's like she looks at me, but I don't say anything, and then we go back to her. I always see a bunch of cars in front of your place. She has meetings at the house. She gives demonstrations. Isn't that like a pyramid scheme? What's that? You know, you get a bunch of people. There are all these levels. Everyone tries to get to the next level, tries to get to the top, like Scientology or the Mafia. My mom is not in the Mafia. She doesn't know you're here. She's gone this afternoon. It's the first time I've seen you on the bus. She drives me. I'm getting a car soon. What kind? The brand new kind. But what make and model? I don't know. Tyler, my brother, he just got a Hummer. It's actually a second Hummer. He totaled the first one. Almost killed someone. So my dad got him another. I want something that costs the same price as two fucking Hummers. <laughs> like maybe a Jag. You think your dad will get you a Jag? Maybe. If I act like a giant jerk, he's totally circula circling the drain. He'll buy one to save me. Otherwise, I'll probably, it'll probably be a Toyota. <laughs> Still. Yeah, then I could drive you to school. My mom drives me. Wouldn't you rather, I mean, it's high school. You don't have the car yet, so you can't drive me, so there's no point in discussing it. No point discussing it. Okay, Dad. Just, didn't you just say your brother has an Xbox? <laughs> um, do you want a uh, bike it in? My brother's a candy man. I know where he keeps his stash. Won't that slow my reflexes? <laughs> Haven't you done it before? No. You should ask Mummy for a sip of her special shake. She doesn't make special shakes. She doesn't get that many people over for vitamins. Look, I didn't come here to do drugs or listen to you insult my mom. I thought we were playing a game. That's the only reason you came over? You barely said hello to me in four years. So I'm saying it now. Yeah, because I have an Xbox. I wanted to, it's just, you know. What, your mom? No, not my mom. She stopped letting you out because you got so cute. Look, shut up, Michaela. I stopped coming over because you're such a flippin' know-it-all. I don't have to take this crap. I'm leaving. We got neighborhood three. <laughs> <laughs> You've got neighborhood three. It's Tyler's, but I know where he hides it. <laughs> okay. But my mom doesn't stop me. Okay. Okay. I have to sneak into his room. I'm dying to play Neighborhood 3. That sounds like something out of a horror movie. Like you're about to play this video game, and you think it's just a game, but actually it's real. But these teenagers don't know it, but the audience knows it. Mm -hmm. And this one kid's like, I'm dying to play, and it's like, ooh, foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching Cody play. So he's your contact. He's got all the walkthroughs, so you know what to look for in the game. Bet Cody doesn't have chocolate milk. Bet that's why you came over here. He came on to me. No way. Cody came on to you. I think so. He kept saying how good I was with the joystick, and they're not even called joysticks anymore. <laughs> I can't believe it. 
He's so hot. Next time I see him, I'm going to tell him I'm pretty good with his joystick. Are you? <laughs> I could be. Well, let's try on the game and find out. Wait, are you, what are you? Nothing. I'll set it up and you can play. I'll try the truth. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the game? The game. What are you? Nothing. Sorry, they're having sexual confusion. They're teenagers. <laughs> I'll set it up. You can play. You're not going to play? Nah. Do some split screen with me. No. Why not? This game's fucked up. It maps out your own neighborhood. How creepy is that? Are you kidding me? It's sweet. It's the best use of satellite technology I can think of. Oh, now he's excited. How can you not think it's sweet? There's no point to it. Sure there is. You have to keep getting to the next level. You have to get to the top. And then what? You're out. You're free. You beat everything and nothing can hurt you anymore. My brother beats the shit out of those things. He gets online and plays with his friends. The sicker the game, the more they like it. He whacks those zombies to smithereens and spends a little too much time with them after they're dead. <laughs> Sometimes it's fun to be sick. Sometimes you need a place to be sick. That's not the only place he's sick. You don't know much about my brother. He plays at Cody's house. What? Tyler, he's almost at the last chapter. Have you been out? Have you been hanging out with him? They won't let me play the game. They keep calling me a noob. What else? What do you do with them? What do you mean? Any of that other sick shit? Any of their missions in the neighborhood? Missions? Maybe your mom would want to know about this. Would want to know about her beautiful vitamin shake boy. What if I told your mom? You say a fucking word to my mom and I'll... What? Slice my titties off like they do the girl zombies in the game? <laughs> You're nuts. Just leave. You're the one who invited me. I didn't know you got so twisted. It's only a game. Oh, right, Trevor. Don't tell me you've never seen it. Seen what? One of those things like reach out. What thing? In the game, while you're hacking it, reach out with what's left of its hand and gurgle, I'm coming to get you for real. End of scene. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 So like again, we're strangers in this world, and um, so the uh, the play because the, these kids are also new to this game that everyone's involved in, right? And the play is helping us learn things about it, like having Michaela explain what, or right, having Trevor explain what a walkthrough is to Michaela. It's like it tells you what to do, right? And that helps us orient us about what's happening. I love the exposition in this scene, actually. I think it's really uh, smooth, and it also creates the tone of the play, where on the one hand, it's like it's sort of like a horror movie in that, you know, and at the same time it's also making these sort of postmodern ironic comments about horror movies, even though it's, it, we're sort of in a horror movie at the same time. It's sort of very winky and, and ironic and know-it-all, like everything's in quotes, but sort of scary at the same time, which is a, a, a kind of a cool gambit, I think. Um, what's that? Oh, I've lost my page. Hold on. Anyway, so getting close to the end of this. Oh, so this, um, so, Here's something, another way to get into, a, to create a world for a play using language, right? So I'm guessing that everybody here probably has access to some sort of esoteric vocabulary that nobody else has. Like, um, some, you know, maybe you went to med school, or maybe you play a sport or a card game that nobody else here plays, or maybe you have a boat and you know some boating words, or you know how to fix something that nobody else in the room can fix, and you know some words from that. So think about what kind of, like, where do you have some sort of esoteric vocabulary that you learned at some point in your life? Some words that nobody else here would know the meaning of, you know, probably. And if you write down like, so here's an assignment for you, write down like five of these words or so. People can yell them out if they want, because that would be entertaining. <laughs> Somebody the other day was naming parts of a violin using words that I never heard before, because it was something they had to learn. And they were researching violin making for a poem, actually, I think it was. Anyone know some words the rest of us might not know? Coding, mahjong. Glissando. Glissando, there you go. <laughs> it's even more obscure than glissando. Pianoforte. Pianoforte. <laughs> Louisiana Bell. Louisiana Bell. Okay, I have no idea what that is. That's good. 
Is that kind of rice? Oh, good, okay. Do you have one? Padisha. Padisha? I almost know what that is. It's a ballet step. Ballet step, right, good, ballet, right, yes. There's lots of things that have, yes. Beluvius. Beluvius. Good. What is that? It's the tail of a fraggle, which is a muppet. Humongous. I'm the right age for five years. Humongous. Humongous? That's a technical term, I think. So, once you have some sort of vocabulary of this kind, and the more obscure, the better. How did Michelle say good? Um, you can put them in a scene in which two people are speaking, and both the people in the scene. So imagine a scene first. Both the characters share this vocabulary. You know, they're both work in the navy, or they're both ballet school survivors, um, or or actual ballerinas, and, or, or ballet dancers, and you know, they both know what they're talking about. So the audience is figuring out what they mean through context. A little bit like some of the words in that scene we just read when we were talking about the game and how it works. So we're learning about it, but from an uh, but but with difficulty. Some things we figure out, some things we may not figure out yet. We're going, you know, but they we know that they both know, and they're both part of this world. Um, and then the second part of the assignment, which uh, for homework, is um, have them keep talking, but then raise the stakes, make them, give them something to argue about that's important, but they're still using these words that we don't necessarily know exactly what they refer to. One per, a writer who does this really, really well um, is Aaron Sorkin. If anyone saw Moneyball, um, it's very good. he also wrote The West Wing and uh, A Few Good Men and um, the recent movie about Facebook, he wrote that. He's very good at writing things where, where the characters all share an uh, esoteric vocabulary and the audience has to catch up with them. So this is going to be the first scene of your play. It's going to be great. And it's going to be a play that takes the audience into some world that they've never been in before. Um, the last example I wanted to give, and this is not oh, this is going to, well, never, this is going to look terrible. Um, I'll just turn it sideways if you can admire it, instead of actually read it. Oops! <laughs> you can tell I don't do a lot of PowerPoint. <laughs> anyway, this is, <laughs> this is <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about this, another play that um, this sort of wraps things up nicely. I hope this is actually the so this is the first play that my company uh, produced in New York and uh, which was lucky because it did really well and it was a beautiful beautiful play. This was back in two thousand and five. It was a play called The Internationalist by Anne Washburn and um, so the the the, ba the principle behind our company thirteen P was we were formed it was formed by thirteen playwrights and we were trying to um, become less powerless as playwrights. Uh, we were we were all sort of in the middle of our careers, we and we had met. It all started when I met a couple of the people who became part of the company um, at the O'Neill Playwrights Workshop, which is located near uh, the place where O'Neill Eugene O'Neill grew up in in Waterford, Connecticut. And there's a center there where they develop new plays, and they have the National Playwrights Conference, which is sort of a big deal for your career if you get in. And we all, you go there and you have a one week long workshop of your play with all sorts of fabulous actors and directors and things. And supposedly it, it launches your career, which it sometimes does. And, but it also sort of epitomizes the way new, the new play structure works in the United States, which is uh, a system which no one's very happy with, where you have a workshop of your play or a reading of your play where actors are reading from the script, so they rehearse, they rehearse for like two or three days and then they, they read from the script in front of the audience at music stands, or maybe they even walk around a little bit, which is basically the difference between a reading and a workshop, right? In a reading, everyone's in a music stand and they might never have looked at the play when they show up. Uh, in a workshop, they've rehearsed like for two hours, or maybe, you know, even a few days. And they read it and maybe sit in a chair and stand up and that sort of thing. And neither of them are really like rehearsing a play and then producing it. And um, the way plays are supposed to advance in the US and grow is you have a lot of readings and a lot of workshops and then maybe someday someone says, all right, we're going to actually produce this play, but more likely they don't. 
more likely you just have more readings and more workshops. And eventually they say, isn't it time you wrote another play? Because you had 10 workshops of that play. Um, and you go, but it was never seen by, by civilians. It was only seen by theater people at the National Playwrights Conference. And they say, well, you should keep writing. Um, this is a system that no one's happy with, and no, even the people who run it are not happy with it. They just don't have enough money to produce every fabulous new play that they have, because not very many people actually, because theater is a marginal undertaking, right, in the U.S. And so um, we were trying to, one of the, we were trying to create a, an alternative method for people who had been involved with this sort of rinse cycle of plays for a long time, um, by showing that if you, you could produce plays actually very cheaply if you were smart about it, and yet still produce them visibly enough to get an audience and to have the play get reviewed and to have the play emerge into the world as a finished product, rather than having more workshops and more readings of it. And uh, so the 13 of us formed a company and we chose an order in which we wanted to present our plays over the course of uh, seven years. And we decided we were going to, uh, our mission of this company was going to be to raise money, produce seven plays, and then implode. Uh, we didn't want to create an institution that would last forever, we just wanted to create this one project. Uh, and this summer we're going to uh, produce our 13th play uh, by the aforementioned Sarah Rule and then have a big party. So uh, the first thing we produced was the Internationalist, and the reason it was the first one was because Anne said, I really feel that this play should be produced while George W. Bush is still president. And um, because it's sort of about uh, being an American and going out into the world, and as an American, you don't know anything about the world, because you only know about America. And uh, as it turned out, George W. Bush got reelected, so it was uh, we had lots of time. But nonetheless, we did it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we did it right away. And uh, um, so this is so this is sort of an extreme example. Uh, this whole play is an example of the newcomer strategy that I was talking about before, where there's this world that's unfamiliar to us because we're in a foreign country, um, and. The, there's one character who's the American Lowell, and he's confused, of course. And so we associate, with the audience in New York naturally identifies with him, because he's the American. And for this play, Anne created a fictional foreign country, which is never known, but we get the sense that it's probably in Eastern Europe somewhere, and a fictional language for the characters to speak who live there. So she invented this language. Um, and the actors actually had to memorize the actual lines that she wrote, they, because she, wrote, she created a fictional language with internal grammar, so they couldn't just say gobbledygook, they had to actually learn the lines, which was very interesting. Um, and in fact, there's an amazing um, um, American actor, uh, what is his name? Um, I think now I've, I've lost it. Uh, but uh, he, who actually had to step into the, to a role in the middle of the run with only two days of rehearsal, and he nonetheless learned most of the lines in the invented language, and the rest of them he wrote on the desk on stage. Um, I still have like 10 minutes, right? Or five minutes? Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to read the quick, the shortest bits from this to give you a sense of how it works. But this uses the same device as play I was talking about earlier, fast labor, the one about economic migrants. In that, the, so most of the, there's Lowell and all the other characters are citizens of this imaginary foreign land. And so when they're when the when the citizens are alone on stage, they speak English so that the audience can understand them. But as soon as Lowell enters the room they start speaking their own language unless they're speaking to him in English. Now, again, it's an Eastern European country, so they all speak perfect English when they speak to him uh, because they all learned it in school, because they're from one of those countries where they have education, you know, again, again, not like where I'm from. Um, so uh, at the very beginning of the play, three of the office workers are standing around, and someone has just come into their office. It's a play about business also. Lola's there on business, visiting the headquarters in this country. And they're all standing around talking about a picture which a maintenance worker has just come in and hung on the wall of their office. And the characters are James, Irene, and Nicole. And James says, uh, what is that exactly? Irene, I don't know, James. They put it up because they're like, my job may suck, but at least I'm not in a factory. And Irene says, do you think it's a factory? Maybe they're at a concert or something. They're all standing there looking at this picture. James, the light, the light looks so bright, like a UFO or something. Nicole, that's the new artwork? I mean, yeah, I'm not sure if I like it or not. Nicole, I know a guy I'm purchasing. He says there's not a piece in this company that this company owns worth under 20000 Try to come at it from that perspective. James, they could be at a church. 
Nicole, and then Nicole says, what I like about it is that it's complicated enough that no one's going to come into my office and say, you know, my kid could have done that. Irene, yeah, well, that would be the hope of good child rearing. Nicole, and then at this point, in the middle of this line, Nicole, uh, Lowell, the American, comes into the office, but no one notices him at first. So Irene says, yeah, that would be the hope of good child rearing. Nicole, have you heard of Laura Tim Hardy Dolcott on the feed? Nicole, do you want to head to see for bada da on doy? I mean, come and show a toy in ID Cruz. I mean, on dramatic, on to he eat it. Nicole, come for now, grad hamade el que de hello. Oh my God, hello. <laughs> that way he seems so he seems Lola and starts addressing him in English. And then, so the point of view, whenever Lola's on stage, is from his point of view. And people are speaking to him in English, but occasionally speaking to each other in this imaginary foreign tongue. Um, and, uh, so again, Lowell is a newcomer in this world, which is great, because everybody has to explain to him what ha why this country is different from America, which is really what the play is sort of about, about this being, about this being an American and running around like you own the place and being lost. It's a beautiful play full of wonderful speeches. One of the ones that I think of most often is this speech where and Lowell falls in love with someone in this play, and they have some interesting arguments. Um, and he has, there's a, he has a dream where he's arguing with her about um, why Americans are not as bad as she thinks, which is one of the big topics of the play. Uh, why Americans are not as bad as you think if you're from, if you're from Europe. Uh, although the play does repeatedly suggest that maybe they are. Um, but, Someone, I was arguing with someone about, about America recently, and this came up actually, because um, in one of the ways that Lowell tries to excuse Americans the way they stomp around the world if they own the place and um, are, are take it so unreasonably personally when, for example, they're the subject of a terrorist attack, is he, he Lowell says to his friend from the other country, it's because we don't have the same experiences that you do in the older countries. We've never, you know, we've been, we've lost a war, but we've never had anyone on our doorstep. We've never had that thing where you're helpless, where they're coming into your house and taking your things and raping your wife. We've never had that. That's a really interesting speech about Americans. Um, on a lighter note, I just wanted to do one last bit from this play, which I thought would be a good conclusion to the <coughs> ideas about language and, and translation of plays. There's a character, Lowell meets a guy in the, who works in the office, and his name is Paul. And Paul speaks with an English accent, so at first Lowell thinks that he's English, but it turns out that it just, that he's from a native to this fictional country, but when he was a child, his tutor in English was British and had a British accent, so he's picked up that accent. Um, but he's actually belongs to this foreign country. Does that make sense? So the guy with the English accent is actually a native of the foreign land. And they're talking about uh, this foreign language that they speak in this country. And Paul says, do you speak a little? This is going to be my terrible English accent to distinguish the two characters. Do you speak a little? Not at all. Oh, that's a pity. It's a great language, really. Much more workable than English. Yes, I'd like to learn it. Or at least, if this hadn't all been so sudden, I would have gotten a phrase book. Or is that one of those things? Is that annoying here? I mean, in France, or, or is it, do I get points for making effort? Just don't try to greet people, or you'll get it wrong. Otherwise, I'd say make the attempt. It seems in general, though, most people have a fair amount of English. Oh, yes, they have it. They're not happy about it, though. English is such a Frankenstein monster of a language, you know. It's French patched together with German, with pieces of Russian, Arabic. So there's a perpetual inner tension all on its own, a continual slow process of cultural indigestion, if you ask me. When I speak it for a long period of time, I feel I become a little uncomfortable. Did you know that about your language? I'm just curious. <laughs> I did. I'm always curious about what Americans know and what they don't know. Educated people know that. But okay, here's the thing. I mean, we have a very big vocabulary, right? I mean, it's very large. I think we get points for that. You know, like, it's like a tool set. We have a lot of tools. I mean, maybe we're not sophisticated. Maybe we're not total artisans, but that's a lot of tools. Tools are impressive. <laughs> yes, to me, that's as if one says, I have an enormous army with a lot of men, but they, they're all Italians. Where do they get me, you know? <laughs> and then this is where I just want to end with this. Then another person person sitting in the office listening to this says, oh, I have a question. Do you know that what you did to the Indians was very wrong? <laughs> we do know that, yes. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, because we're very sorry for them here. We're very sorry for them there, too. That's <laughs> 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 Does anyone have any questions for us? We have a few.
few minutes if you have if you'd like to ask. <coughs> yes, that's the um, You were talking about American uh, playwright, mm. and I was brought up the British. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the thing that thrives in British theatre is the repertory company. Right. And on my visits to America, I tried in vain to find good quality out of town fringe theatre and never found it. Right. Um, is there a reason for this? Wow, that's a good question. French <laughs> theatre. What's that? In America. Uh, French theatre. In America. Oh, um, you can't find it in America. In a, no, no. Well, I mean, it's you, you don't find like a big. There was a time uh, where there was a period in the after World War II where every big city in America, thanks to the National, or really in the sixties, thanks to the National Endowment for the Arts, where the big cities in America, or medium, even medium-sized cities, all tried to build up a big theater. Uh, and, and even house a permanent company of actors that could do a repertory of plays and do a season of three or four plays. And it would be something that you would go to the same way you would, people would go to the symphony or the orchestra. Um, they do the same thing, but you know what I mean. The, <laughs> the orchestra or the ballet. And many of them were very successful for a while, and some of them, not, not, not very many even, uh, tried to develop new plays and, and, be, and do new work as part of that mission. The problem is that it just became harder and harder as uh, the government funding was gradually cut by mostly mostly by right wing governments, and it became very hard to sustain. And there's another or fewer than ever before, and some of them are still closing. Um, it's very difficult. And as and as that was happening, because there were you, because there was only one of these theaters able to survive, you know, because of the limited resources of people going to the theater or supporting the theater in each big city. You couldn't really, you didn't really find more than five or nine actors who were professionals or had been trained living in each city, and therefore they would tend to leave. Um, and as a result of that, by the time that I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, your local company like um, of the one big theater in Pittsburgh or the one big theater in St. Louis or in San Diego would actually go to Los Angeles or New York to have auditions, and then hire actors to fly out and do one show and then fly back to where they lived. So then, uh, and then that, that was bad for, which is still going on, and that's actually bad for everyone, because then on top of everything, when, I, when it's my turn to cut your funding from the San Diego Arts Council, I can also say, you're not even supporting local employees by hiring someone from San Diego. To which you're going to say, well, there's no actors living in San Diego. Why would you be an actor in San Diego? And then so it's sort of a vicious circle in which everyone loses. Um, but sometimes there are small, you know, feisty theaters run by young people for a couple of years in cities, and that can be really exciting, um, and small experimental theaters. But the national theater scene is a little come and touch and go, it's true. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions about anything? <laughs> <laughs> yes? I mean, what is it about playwriting that like could cause that, like you wanted that to be your outlet? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I think it's because, again, it's because it's a collaborative art form. I don't really, because um, I am a writer, I mean, you know, I was one of those kids who was most at home with books and with writing and things like that, but I also didn't, but I didn't really want to be by myself. I like to be in a room full of people. <laughs> and so, uh, theater's a really good place for that kind of writer, and by contrast, it's a very, it tends to be not a good place for writers who do want to be in charge or who do want to be the only voice in the room and the only smart person in the room. I think collaboration is very exciting. And the opportunity, particularly to see, not only to have your play come to life and change and realize things about your play, working with actors and directors and have them bring to things that, bring things to the characters that change the characters and make you go back and change the writing and then bring it back in is exciting. And also the ability to go see multiple different groups of people produce the same play and see what different things they bring to it is really exciting. Um, I like that plays are not, never really finished in that way. Because there's always another production that's going to be different than the other. Yes. And how do you see the future? How do I see the future <laughs> of the theater? <laughs> oh my gosh! I don't know. Um, I think what's going on. I tend to think uh, because I've been a producer, I think of things in terms of uh, where the money is going and coming from and going to a lot, which is interesting to me. Um, some of the theater practitioners who are getting the most attention right now, in a way going back to an older model, 
have become writer directors, or people like me, I guess, who are starting their own companies and trying to find new ways of getting their work done without relying on commercial production or on the institutional nonprofits, which tend to be kind of stale and desperately trying to survive by doing established things like revivals of Oklahoma or South Pacific. So, uh, one of the ways that people are finding to be in charge of their own future is to use a model that's more like a rock band or a dance company, where you create something, where you actually build the whole play. You hire the actors, you hire the director, you do the writing or whatever, and you build the play, and it's like a dance piece that can then tour to theaters all over the country or even all over the world, and you use that model, which is interesting, and can be, I think it has a lot of potential. Um, it's also a good, can also be a source of government funding and or, or other kind of artistic funding because you're then an, an artistic ambassador of sorts as you're traveling to international arts festivals. Uh, like my friend Young Jean Lee, who is part of 13P, has been doing this with a great deal of success. I don't know if she's come to this country yet, but I imagine she will at some point. Um, with her avant-garde work, work, which deals a lot with race and is really interesting stuff. So I think that's, a, that's an exciting model. Different kinds of models that many of the, I think many of what's exciting right now are different kinds of plays that are made to not happen in theaters, but to happen in different kinds of places like art galleries or concert halls. In 13P, do you tape or film these plays you've done? No. We don't, I mean, uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, first of all, artistically, theater is meant to be live for all kinds of reasons. I know. Because that's exciting. Sure. But it's also, um, and this is a perpetual challenge from a fundraising or marketing point of view, but if you work with actors who are part of the Actors Union, Actors Equity in the United States, you can't film or, or, oh. videotape, or videotape them almost at all. You supposedly can use them for private purposes, but even that is very difficult to wrangle sometimes. So uh, that's very complicated and difficult. It's an ongoing question, and we even have to face that question with our, our, the student actors we have at the conservatory where I teach, because uh, there's fear that someone does a bad performance of Three Kerning Desire when they're 22, they don't want that on, on Facebook and when they grow up, you know, <laughs> become parents. Basically, how are you documenting them? How do you document it? Uh, well, you sort of don't. What, what, do you, how do you know? <laughs> people that were there? I guess so, yeah. I, I mean, this has always been the problem in theater is how do you communicate. I mean, the, you can take still photos and use them for publicity, uh, which is mostly beneficial to designers and good-looking actors rather than playwrights. Um, you know, you can still publish your plays. In fact, play publishing is somewhere, is somewhere, in some ways is getting back up. There was a, when I was going to plays, there were, there were like, three, you know, very, there were relatively few plays published. No one has ever made any money publishing plays, and, it, you know, because they're mainly bought by other theater people, uh, of which there are not very many. So, um, you know, the number of play, the play publishing probably reached its low point a couple of years ago, uh, when I think really only Samuel French was left publishing plays. And then with the internet, it started to go back up again, because you can now get uh, public people who are publishing on the internet or publishing print-on-demand books on the internet, which is very cheap. There's no royalties involved, but at least the plays are available again. And so I think things are improving in, in that way. So in terms of getting the work out, in terms of distributing your scripts, like someone who has never met you in Topeka, Kansas, can, or in Tel Aviv, can read your play and go, I'm going to produce this at my theater. I think things are improving in that way. Um, but yeah, it's very difficult. Theater people have always been very bad at communicating with each other. There's only one magazine or journal devoted to theater in the United States, and it's, it's not very good, although it's better than it used to be. What is it? American theater. Um, <laughs> there's also, okay. there's all, there are two. There are two extremely academic ones, but people in theater don't read the academic ones, and theater academics don't talk to real theater people and like that. <laughs> mostly, yeah. <laughs> there's mostly a divide between theater practitioners and people who study theater. It's, it it, it cor cor corresponds to um, Barnett Newman's quote, you know, about aesthetics when he said, uh, "Aesthetics are for artists in the way that ornithology is for the birds." <laughs> <laughs> 